we don't have enough resources to cover all the square miles and that, that this fire was affecting at the time. So for us, it's going, where could this possibly go? My name is John Spikerman. I'm a division chief for the Ventura County Fire Department, and I am in charge of the Simi Valley and Thousand Oaks area. I have been with the department about 29 years, and I've worked in you know almost every city. I started my career kind of over in the east end of Ventura, into Ojai, to Camarillo, uh, into Thousand Oaks, then into Simi, and then into our wildland unit. Uh, I was inspired by my uncle and my father. They were both firefighters for Ventura County. Um, they both promoted to the position of battalion chief uh, the exact same day. And then my son most recently, uh, in the last three years, got hired for the city of Los Angeles Fire Department. So we're a three generation fire family. And so that, that inspiration continues on for us. When the fire started, I was working in my office at the training division. So I was the department coordinator for that week. Um, so it was Monday night, six o'clock. I was the department coordinator. I heard the fire go out. I heard it on the radio. Investigator 13, responded to reports of a brush fire. 1681 Dickinson Drive, Cross Cemetery, Command 2. I heard Chad Cook. I heard what the reports were. I knew it was gonna be a fast moving fire. So I started moving out that direction. I called the duty chief and uh, let him know, hey, I was moving out towards the fire to see if they needed any help. And I heard structures were threatened and he asked me to, he goes, hey, I need you to get to a place where we can coordinate. So I turned around and went back to my office and told them where I was and started, you know, making sure that we had resources and battalion chiefs coming back in so that we could run our normal day-to-day -day calls or staff those additional resources that they were asking for. And as the fire got bigger, we knew, or at least me as the department coordinator knew, we were gonna be low on resources. Uh, so bringing those battalion chiefs in, because we still had all our day-to-day -day normal calls. So that's what the department coordinator does, coordinates those items to make sure that we can still function and um, you know, serve the citizens in our normal uh, capacity. Then in communication with our duty chief who was making phone calls and, and asking for resources, trying to get those resources from our local agencies that we have, you know, just those kind of handshake agreements where we're going, hey, we need somebody, we, we need them now. With everybody else still under that same threat of that east wind, because there could be more than one fire. So that was my first 12 hours. And then in the morning, uh, the duty chief had called me and said, hey, I need you to go tie in with Chad Cook. You're going to end up being a branch. It was off of the 150 right there uh, in Santa Paula. So the fire had started in that Santa Paula area, almost where that area of origin was. We still had homes that were burning. We still had embers around homes. Um, they had not at that point. They were addressing all the things that were all the fire that was coming through, you know, the Santa Paula proper area. But it had it was on the east side of the 150 and was going to be spreading east towards Fillmore. So I was addressing those, trying to get resources to be able to address that because when we're you know, trying to fight a fire, we're always looking for that anchor point. We always got to start someplace and we start with a good anchor point and you start working from there. But in this fire, we had so many homes threatened, it, it went from that normal kind of anchor and flank to really just protecting people's lives. That next morning when I got there, they had already done a lot of evacuations. There were still people around, a lot of traffic. Um, we had resources in the area that had been there for eight, nine, ten hours already. So they had a pretty good lay of the land. I was out there getting debriefed by the branch who was, you know, going in to get some rest. So they still had fires, you know, structure fires that were happening. The guys that were working in the area, I think there was like three strike teams of type threes and type ones. And so we still had fires that were igniting in homes. So they were patrolling the area, doing the tactical patrol, and then putting out those structures as they lit, lit off and just still making sure the citizens were safe. So I was probably out there about four hours getting getting my briefing so the other individual could, you know, go get some rest. So at that same time, we had fire that was backing um, uh, over into some homes off the 150 on the east side. So fire was bumping into those homes right at that moment. So I couldn't leave my post. I had to just make sure that we protected those homes and we had resources in place and the guys were safe. And once I got that secured, I got a couple phone calls telling me I need to get to the command post. I need to drive around operations. And I said, okay, I, I'm, I gotta wait. I gotta make sure I cannot leave my post right now. So once it was all safe and everybody was good and they had supervision. And so the gentleman, I had to ask him, can you cover my branch? And I go, cause I'm being asked to go. So now he had two branches and he had been out there all night. And so I reported to the incident command post, was tied in with the operations section chief. And I was asked to do it because of my wildland experience in the county and all those canyons and streets and roads. I had that 
um, expertise of those canyons so that way we could get into places quickly and give him some of that uh, information or intel to go, this is the topography, this is what the fuel looks like, this is what you might be able to expect, the fire behavior and, and how it might react. So we can do some better, you know, long-term strategic planning as we, you know, went through the day. At the beginning, we're doing a lot of initial attacks. So we're, we're attacking the, the fire at that point of danger, you know, in homes and things like that. But really trying to step back, getting those resources in there working and protecting the citizens, as well as putting in line or having the dozers working or helicopters and aircraft working in the proper places. We still have to take a look and go, hey, where could this possibly go? You know, we don't have enough resources to cover all the square miles and that, that this fire was affecting at the time. So for us, it's going, where could this possibly go? And trying to make sure that we set objectives to meet that. So it's, um, you know, setting the management objectives. It's, it's setting that box, you know, drawing that box out and go, we should be successful inside this box. Now let's fight the fire according to that and, and set objectives for the day that will support us stopping it in that box. For about the first three days, if we look back, we could say we were probably initial attacking it and not looking at that long-term strategic planning and, and drawing that out. We drew boxes, but they were easily overran. So once we realized, you know, the, the wind's not gonna stop. We get, a, you know, three days of east wind or so, and it kind of tapers off and we still may have some, you know, dry weather, but we don't have that, that force, that wind, that's really our main driving force of the fire. Our fields were already, you know, in that critical state. You know, we have good topography here to run, you know, have good runs uphill, but now we have the wind that's pushing it and, you know, having that long-term spotting and really threatening so many different people's homes. You know, it came into Ventura that first night. Uh, people are in their homes. They don't even know there's fire if they're not paying attention to the news and they're just living their normal life. So far, we've been really successful at knocking out fires, but with that east wind. So, so for the first three days, we, we were setting up objectives, drawing a box, and we were putting our resources into that box, and then the wind never stopped. So with that wind also, our air resources were limited because everywhere we really wanted to attack that fire had that smoke blowing over the top of it. So the fire's burning underneath that smoke and we can't put air resources in there to knock it down or utilize them the best way we possibly could to slow the fire down. And then, and it was, it covered so many square miles that it was, the fire was really attacking and moving at so many different places to spread. It, it just starts spreading your resources out real thin. So, you know, how do you really get around that? How do you, how do you flank that? And, and then start bring, bringing that back when you have those opportunities. So, so we ended up making the box pretty big and it did stay within the box, but it bumped it bumped a couple, a couple of those edges. So it was realistic for the resources that we had. And I think we attacked the fire where necessary, set up good objectives, good tactics, but with the wind blowing, it, it was really difficult because the way it burned, it came into Ventura and then jumped the 33 on the south side as it you know, would not be real active in, in the Ojai area, up in the upper Ojai area, but it was still active and creeping out and then would end up lining up with topographies or canyons and picking up that wind and it would ran above, you know, Ojai proper and then came into the homes and threatened all those. So there was different shifts of moving resources to those critical areas and those branch and divisions sharing those resources because nobody had enough. Nobody had enough to really complete their job. It was just too big. But they did a great job shifting shifting resources and, and borrowing resources and saying, hey, can I, I'm, I need three more strike teams. I have all these homes uh, threatened right now. Our second priority is now branch four. Our second priority is now branch four. All incoming resources will be assigned to branch four for immediate structure protection above the city of Ventura. And so that was, a, that was, I think, one of the great things and one good successes that we had where people would ask for resources, we would supply them, but then they shared them where necessary and they were very good about getting back into their original position to help out as the fire advanced into that next division that's part of the planning piece of it where ops works with planning to go we the, we're on a 24-hour most resources are on a 24-hour shift so ops has to work with plans so that way we're getting guys rest so you can't run a engine company so we've got you know 3,500 3, people out there a day well, you have to have 3,500 people in reserve to take their place for the next day. So that's that whole team effort and that's planning and logistics and making sure we've got food and we've got places for them to rest properly so they can come back out and go fight that fire. That was, you know, challenging every single day. So they set up the incident command post at the fairgrounds and, um, you know, Chad Cook noticed quickly, I mean, e even getting evacuations ordered quickly. 
um, was, so, was such a, you know, a smart thing to do. And then they ordered a, you know, a type one incident management team to come in. They have the resources, the, you know, the trailers, they, they can, they have the logistical contacts, you know, the staff, the personnel that are trained to the levels that they need to be to be able to manage an incident of this, this size. You know, I think, I can't remember the exact date, but it was about eight, nine days into it or something, then they ended up bringing in an additional incident management team to help out because it was so big and it was threatening the forest on the north side and heading into Santa Barbara. So, you know, and Santa Barbara had, you know, their whole zone once it did get across, uh, you know, the county border. I enjoy going out and, you know, working those divisions and branches and, you know, being out there all night. Uh, that's really rewarding. So this was a new level for me. And it was, this was that next step that I'm taking. So for me to be able to have my task book open and have a couple of small assignments as an operations or a branch, you know, in county on some of our smaller fires, this is what I needed to go to that next level. But the experience that I gained was, you know, it's, it's invaluable. There's, you know, to be there and be there for 18 days and to learn something and then be able to, by the time it was over, you know, apply the things that I was learning, you know, over those 18 days was, was a was great learning experience for me. There was another individual that came in to assist me. He just kept looking at me going, you've got to, you've got to just be, you know, chomping at the bit to get out of here. And it's like, yeah, I would love to be out there. And I'm listening to the radio and I think I could add value, but my value was there as a department coordinator. And, and you know, when that's it, I go, yeah, I'd love to be out there but this is my job and I'm gonna give it 110% and I'm gonna do the best I can because we have the rest of the county to, you know, to protect. I have a report of a vehicle uh, overturned, uh, impacted by fire with a subject trapped at Wheeler Canyon. Should be just off your location. Uh, actually, I got an engine strike team coming in right now. I'll send them up. Uh, that's affirmative. I did reach that location, confirm there was a vehicle on fire with a civilian potentially still inside the vehicle. We did make one uh, civilian rescue. That person was uh, driven down the road by uh, sheriff's deputy. Uh, we have fire on both sides of the, of the road up here, and we've lost several structures. Listening on the radio to just different things that were happening in Wheeler Canyon, I know those individuals that were on that radio, and I know what their expertise, and I know their level of uh, their confidence and their confidence. And to hear them on the radio with that confidence, but stating what they were experiencing, to me, you almost couldn't have picked better individuals to be out there in that environment uh, to you know, manage that challenge. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, every firefighter that's out there for days and days and days, it's exhausting. They get back up. Even when you get a 24-hour shift off, you're still, you're still, it, it, it just wears on you and you have that fatigue. But, you know, the guys stay in shape and, and they're, they're conditioned to do it mentally. They're, they're tough to get, tough enough to get out there and do it. I mean, I've heard everything from, you know, Chief Shea when he got hit by a vehicle and he went to the hospital and he was back out in 12 hours. You know, people trapped in cars, you know, having to come up with ways to grab the hose to go out to the different horse pastures where you can't see and smoke. I think the guys are just going from a thing where we've trained to, you know, do structure protection to, you know, full on evacuations where, you know, citizens don't know what to do. They're, they're, st they're stopped at red lights while smoke and embers are hitting their car, not engaging to go, this is a life and death situation. I need to run the red light. People wandering and standing in the street going, where, where I, I got out of my neighborhood, but now where do I go? And so going from that, you know, you know, attacking a fire directly or doing structure protection or fire front following where it comes through and then we go back. From those guys' point of view and listening to the radio, it was just saving people's lives. There was just thousands of people out there and they're having to figure out where do we tell them to go? We need to get them out of this dangerous area. Even if it's just keep walking towards the ocean, you know, because most of these homes aren't gonna burn up, but these ones on the fringe are already on fire. There was so many challenges that they were having to face and adapt from a lot of the things that we train, trained to do, you know. we haven't experienced, you know, thousands of people standing around doing nothing, getting showered in, you know, smoke and fire embers and people can't breathe, people trapped in vehicles. So just managing those things, I think those were all super, you know, above and beyond that heroic effort for, you know, firefighters to be able to switch gears and manage that. Along with the police department, it's, it's always a team effort for all of us. And then some of the citizens that were doing heroic things, you know, the, you know, firefighters were pulling people and just going, just get in the rig and we're, we're gonna drive you out of here. It's too dangerous. We can't even trust that you're gonna make it down the street. I think those first days, just listening to the radio, you know, wa wanting to be out there, but knowing what my job was, I think those guys did a, did a fantastic job. You couldn't, you couldn't ask for more. I think for me, the experience that I gained and number one, just watching everybody's, everybody's level of expertise is gonna come up. You know, um, I think you look at our fire department and, and 
you know, over the years, it's always been, hey, we're, we're going to have this young fire department. All of a sudden, we have this large fire, you know, like the Simi fire. I think we were at a point where we were going to have this young fire department. We were losing a lot of experience. And then we have this big incident, and all these young guys are gaining this experience that they can draw to. They've seen something that, you know, I've only experienced right now 29 years into my career, and I didn't even get the experience. I got to hear it. So I'm learning from their stories on what they did and how they engaged from doing structure protection, which they trained to do, to an environment that we really haven't done a lot of training in to go, hey, this is this is rescue mode. We are in full rescue mode of thousands of citizens. So I get to hear those, but we have a lot of young captains that were out there doing their thing and learning that. So I think our whole department as a, as a whole is gonna have that experience to draw to, to for something that I didn't get to experience over my 30 year, you know, 29 year career. Unfortunately, we had that fire and people lost their homes and, you know, we lost, you know, one life and then we lost, you know, Corey Iverson's, you know, as a firefighter but I think they're gonna have that experience to draw to, to save lives in the future. And we have firefighters out there that now have experienced something at a really high level that hopefully we don't have to see again. But if we do, they will have that experience to draw to to make better decisions. Just take a really good look. I think the citizens, if they, if they take a good look and prepare themselves, you know, because hopefully it never happens, but it, but it does happen. We've been planning for large fires and doing weed abatement and, you know, and things for years. We were, when we worked with the crew right there in Ventura up, you know, Sexton Canyon, Lake Canyon, Barlow Canyon, we were doing field treatments and we had a whole field treatment plan, you know, to work all the way out to the 150. So I think for all disasters, take a look and are, are you really prepared? You know, are you prepared to be able to, to defend your family, stay in your home, um, in a large earthquake, we, you know, we only have so many resources to be able to come and help thousands of people until we can get more in. So they're going to have to be self-sustaining for a little while, you know, until we can get there. So I would say just take a look at any disaster, earthquake, fire, you know, are you prepared? Is your house prepared? Do you, are you affected by weed abatement? Do you have ornamental brush that in, during an east wind that can blow embers into your, into your neighborhood or into your, your house and burn it down and threaten you and your family? And then there's programs out there. You know, we have a CERT program, which is Citizens uh, you know, Emergency Response Team, which will help you and then be able to help prepare your family, where then you will be somebody who will be able to help in your community. So when others might be panicking, you might have that state of mind to be able to go, hey, I've got this training, let me help you. And it, you know, it's all the way from first aid training, CPR. So there's a lot of things you can do to prepare yourself. So I think, you know, just not, just besides the Thompson incident being a, a big brush fire that affected everybody, there's a lot that citizens can do to help prepare themselves. So they can be successful, make sure they keep their family safe, and then they can go out and also help their neighbors.